Welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. We have a very interesting topic for you tonight. Um, if you're interested in theology, if you're interested in apologetics, if you're interested in uh, sharing the gospel with Muslims, you are going to be confronted with uh, a fairly difficult issue if you don't know how to handle it. And the question is, how can Jesus have a God? Now think about this problem with me. Uh, on the show tonight is C.L. Edwards in the studio, and we're going to have Sam Shamoon on by Skype, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. But uh, let's to, to introduce the topic, uh, C.L. Yes, sir. We believe that Jesus is God, right? Most definitely. And we believe that Jesus did what? That he prayed, he prayed. that he spoke about his Father. That even called God, it even referred to the Father, my God and your God. Yes. Right? yes now, C.L., a Muslim looks at that. How is he going to react? Oh. <laughs> Look at this. Look, he prays, brother. How can he be God? God doesn't pray. Yeah, who's he praying to? Who do, who's he praying to? God doesn't call somebody else God. Yeah, you got God talking to God. You got how many gods there? That's two gods. That's two gods. They and that shows right. you how stupid you Christians are because you got God praying to God and you say there's one God. How silly is that? Uh, you should be able to see that. Why don't you see it, brother? Oh, say, so what, what else, what else, what, what other things uh, might Muslims say? Well, obviously, Jesus, he bowed down. He put his head upon the ground just like the prophets all did. Not like Christians <laughs> do. Not like, I mean, <laughs> some, some Christians pray like that, but I mean, come on. I mean, but it, does God put his head on the ground? Yeah, how's God going to put his head anywhere, right? How's he going to put his head on the ground? What's wrong with him? What else do we believe about Jesus? Well, we believe Jesus is uh, incarnate. Uh-huh. He's incarnate as a man. So he's got a body. He has a body. How did he come into this world? I, he came in through incarnation. He, he came in through the womb of the a womb? virgin. The womb? Wait a minute. You believe God was in a womb? What yeah, else? An unclean place. The same unclean place that happened to grab Allah's robe. But we won't get into that. But uh, uh, these are the things that we believe, and Muslims have an objection about that. Well, you can kind of see why they'd have the objection, right? Uh, yeah, if you're, you know, you're uh, you know, a little ignorant. Did I Jesus see, uh, eat? Jesus ate. So... God needed food? What, what's going on there? He drunk. He had water? Wine? Wine. What? How not, could... not the wine in Jenna. Not the rivers of <laughs> wine in Jenna. This is a filthy, earthly wine. So uh, he ate, he drank. Did he go to the bathroom? Oh, well. We don't have uh, records, right? But what, what do you think based on everything else we know? Yeah, well, I would think so. If you have a real body, which Jesus had a real body, we're not like, you know, like some uh, weirdos who claim that Jesus was some in disembodied spirit who just looked like a human being. He would mm -hmm. spit on the ground, so you believe God spit on the ground? Mm -hmm. Yep, he had, he spit out phlegm. So, the, snot. to kind of sum up the problem, uh, when we say God, we normally mean something specific about God. We, we, we normally refer to certain uh, essential attributes, all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good, omnipresent, perfect in justice, perfect in mercy. We look at these things, and then Christians say, well, look at that guy over there. That's what we've been talking about when we say all-powerful, omnipresent, all-knowing. That's him. And that guy came out of a woman, he used the bathroom, he ate food, he was ultimately put on a cross. You believe God was put on a cross? God was killed by the Romans? God got slapped. God got slapped. God got a, a crown of thorns put on his head. God bled all over the place. God had nails put through his wrists. You're telling me that sort of thing about God? So, what? <laughs> While your God died on the cross, well, who was making the, the heavens stand up? Who was making the sun shine? Yeah, the whole universe should have fell apart. God was dead, right? right? Uh, and even when, even when God's, a, God's a baby, even when Jesus is a baby, you know, who's running the world? You can't have a little baby running the world, right? I, I wouldn't think so. 
So there are all sorts of objections that can come out of this. And one of the ones that, the, you know, the objections that, that comes up again and again, we've already referred to, how can Jesus have a God? Because Jesus is incarnate, Jesus is God, and yet he, throughout his life, acts like he's talking to God. So what's going on here? Is this God talking to God? Uh, Sam Shamoon, our brother, like no other, yeah. are you there? Are you there? Oh, I'm here. Oh, can you guys can hear me? Yeah, yes, we can we hear can. you. We can hear the melodious sound of your voice. All right. Am I centered? I mean, for the camera, because I'm doing this via Skype from my hometown. I'm, yeah, we can see. We see a giant pumpkin in the middle of the screen <laughs> that's talking to us. It looks like a jack-o'-lantern. Uh, hopefully, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, as time goes by, I'm going to shrink physically, but hopefully not mentally. And by the way, I like your haircut, man. Major improvement from a couple of days ago. Thanks, bro. I went out and uh, let, uh, let some lady cut my hair, and she mangled it. You can't tell because I got it combed so well, but she mangled it. Uh, first time I've gone to a female barber in like 15 years. Last time. The guys, wow. are, the guys are rougher. They're like, and they get it, they get it right. And she was all delicate and touching everything, but if you're just touching here and there, you know, it's, it's not even. You can't do that. Only men barbers. All right. Now, Sam, you but heard our objections, didn't you? Oh, boy, yeah. I thought I was going to answer one objection, but you raised up 20. But just as a side note, uh, hey. you look like an older version of Opie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, that's funny. I just called earlier, I called Paul uh, Richie Cunningham, and he didn't know who I was talking about. And I said, you remember, uh, you remember Opie, don't you? He had no clue what I was talking about. These young guys, they don't know anything, man. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I know, because, yeah, it's all this modern technology. But Now, Sam, uh, hold on, hold on, Sam. Did you, you, so you heard our brutal assault on the Christian faith, right? Yeah, make my job a little harder. I think, our I thought unanswerable, just, our unanswerable, yeah. irrefutable yeah. objections just, to the Christian faith. Now, now, Sam, you've been doing this for years. Just to clarify, before yeah. you issue some responses or respond to some of these issues, uh, aren't these exactly the sorts of things that Muslims would say, that Muslims say in our articles, in their comments, in debates, in their YouTube videos? Uh, have we accurately represented the Muslim <clears throat> objections to our view? 100%. In fact, uh, I wanted to mention that this past weekend, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us the privilege and the grace to meet two young Shiite Muslims. Uh, David Wood, myself, and Paul met a young up-and-coming Shiite Muslim apologist. He invited us over to his home, him and his cousin, very bright young men, very respectful, uh, very passionate about what they believe. And one of the main objections that they raise constantly is, you're telling me, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. I go, yes. So he's 100% God, even while on earth. Yes. 100% man, while on earth. Yes. What about in heaven? Yep, 100% God, 100% man. Okay, then, how can he have a God? And he went to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, and I spent some time trying to break it down. But to be honest, it is a complex issue, and I'm not going to deny it. We Christians do not hide the fact that we're dealing with a being, a God, who comes out and pretty much says that he's beyond our ability to fully comprehend. We can know him truly. We can have a relationship with him because he is real and he loves us. But it doesn't mean that we can fully comprehend his infinite essence. The Bible's quite clear. There are over a dozen of passages in the Holy Scriptures, the God-breathed Scriptures, where God says that he is unlike anything in creation and that he's beyond understanding, I mean, fully comprehending. And I can just give you... A sampling of verses and those of you taking notes you can just write these down and maybe Dave you can turn to one passage and read it for us Job 37 verse 5 Job 37 verse 5 if you don't mind if you can just turn there and after you read that I'll just mention a couple more verses that people can write down and go back and read at their own convenience in Job 37 verse 5 we're pretty much told that God is beyond our ability to understand what does it say there brother in your translation says, God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. So it says we can comprehend it, huh? No, it says we cannot comprehend. Okay, and real quickly, look at a couple of New Testament passages that reiterate this point. Look at Philippians 4, verse 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And also, Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, which we'll look at right after Philippians 4, 7. So as Dave, uh, our, our brother David turns to those passages, I want to reiterate the point again. The Bible is quite clear. The God that we worship, the God that has revealed himself in the person of Christ, the God that has spoken in the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible, comes out and says, black and white, I am beyond your ability to fully comprehend. 
That doesn't mean we can't know him truly. We can't have a relationship with him. We can. We can have an intimate relationship with this God who loves us so much that he became flesh and blood for our salvation so that we can know him face to face. Praise his holy name. However, because we are limited and finite, as much as we try, we cannot fully comprehend an infinite mind. That's why it's going to take all eternity for us to grow in our understanding and intimacy with this God and praise his holy name. Philippians 4, verse 7, what does it say, brother? Uh, what was, uh, before I do, what was the Ephesians passage? I had to get on uh, Bible Gateway there. Okay, Ephesians 3, 18 to 19. And by the way, that just tells you this is a live show. We haven't rehearsed this, right? Mm -hmm. so we rehearsed it, he have his verses ready, you know? But hey. anyway. Hey, if we rehearsed <laughs> it, we'd be dangerous. Are right, you ready? Uh, yeah, we would be, yeah. Ephesians, uh, we'll start with, depends, what, start whatever you want. Philippians right. 4, 7. Philippians Ephesians 4, 3, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, hold on, hold on, Dave. You're telling me just a single attribute of God, his peace, is beyond comprehension? Well, that's what, that's what the Bible says. So now, can you imagine God in his totality, how much more incomprehensible he'll be? But maybe, Sam, maybe, maybe the peace of God is the only, only attribute that surpasses our comprehension. Uh, I don't think so. It says that he himself and his ways are beyond our comprehension. And in Ephesians 3, 8, 18 to 19, it says the same thing about the love of Christ, which is interesting. Paul uses the same language to describe the love of Christ, which means that for Paul, Christ is God and he is incomprehensible by nature. In fact, you can confirm it by simply reading for us Ephesians 3, 18 to 19. Now, if you want the context to start at 16, however, for the sake of time, if you want to just jump into 18, go ahead. Uh, Paul is talking about what he wants uh, for the saints, and he says um, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God, to all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. The love, love of Christ, Christ, which surpasses now, knowledge. Uh, now, now th does that sound like a mere mortal, a finite creature, a limited temporal being? Or does this sound like the incomprehensible God who became flesh for our redemption? Hey, Sam, and, 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 and the, the reason this disturbs me so much is, you, you know this, when Muslims approach uh, sort of Christians who don't know a lot, right? That's, that's kind yeah. of their main target audience in the West, uh, Christians who maybe grew up and they you know, maybe went to church here and there, but they don't know a lot. One of the main arguments, it seems, for Islam is, look at that Trinity doctrine you guys believe in. That's hard to understand. Look at our view of God. That's easy to understand. So obviously, you want to go with the easy God to understand instead of that hard God to understand. If, I mean, if you think about how silly and ridiculous this is, what? The easier God is to understand, the more likely it is to be true. If that's the case, I'm going with Zeus, baby. Zeus, the Greek <laughs> gods, they're just like us. They're just like us, but more powerful. They're, so they're even easier to understand than Allah, so why not go with them? I can understand Zeus, he's over there, he's living on a mountain, he's living on Mount Olympus, right? Yeah. I can understand him completely. Why not believe in him, Muslims? It's easy than your uh, immaterial, incon you know, it's, 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 it's much, much easier to believe in than, than, than the God you believe in, so why not go with one of those? Exactly. In fact, what, what's uh, ironic about that argument is that the Muslims will admit that Allah is beyond comprehension and unlike anything in creation. In fact, they cite two references from the Quran to establish the fact that Allah is unlike anything in creation. And, and our brother CL would know these passages, being a former Muslim, a former Salafi. It's chapter 42 of the Quran, verse 11, and chapter 112, verse 4. Chapter 42, verse 11 of the Quran, and chapter 112, verse 4, which pretty much says that Allah is unlike anything in creation. So now, what's ironic about that is that when it comes to the Trinity, one of the main objections that the Muslims raise to deny the Trinity is, well, look at you. You're one being, one person. You're not three persons and one being. In other words, they are likening Allah to creation in order to undermine God's triunity. Isn't that ironic? When the Quran itself says Allah is unlike anything in creation, so then to compare his mode of existence with mine would be shirk, making the creature comparable to Allah and vice versa. In fact, what is more unlike anything in creation if not the triunity of God? So if being incomprehensible unlike anything in creation is an argument against the Trinity, then there goes, there goes the Quran because there are many things about Allah 
that the Muslims cannot understand fully, but they take for granted to be true solely because Muhammad says so. So I think that's very convenient and it's inconsistent of them. So, so if we can't understand something about Allah, praise Allah, he's so far beyond our comprehension. If we can't understand something about the Christian God, you see that's proof that there's a silly man-made yeah. doctrine. Yep, exactly. You hit it right on the nail. It's almost like Muslim apologists are inconsistent. You think? You believe that? Wow. You no, believe that? I don't know about that. It's, it's, like, uh, uh, it's like what Dr. White says, inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's not big, bald, beautiful. He's small, bald, and beautiful. So. <laughs> yeah, but glory to Jesus Christ. And, and I thank the Lord for this time. I, I should have began in prayer, but we trust the Lord Jesus, every one of us, to speak truth clearly boldly in the spirit of love to strengthen our brothers by the power of the Holy Spirit and to convict Muslims by the power of the Holy Spirit to fall in love with this Jesus who is their only hope of salvation. And that's what we want to see. I don't think we say it enough. At least I don't say it enough. I want the Muslims to know that we're doing it because we believe their only hope of salvation is to trust in, believe in, love, worship, and adore the God-man, Jesus Christ. Fully God, fully human, one person. Their only hope of salvation. That's what we're, we're doing this for. Not because we hate Muslims. We want to see them saved. And we want to see our brothers strengthened in the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. So we beg the Lord Jesus to have his way with us tonight and embolden us for his glory. So. All right, Sam, you, 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 say, you say you want people to believe in Jesus, and yet you've got this massive problem. It yeah. would be fine. It would be fine if Jesus had a God. Uh, that's what Muslims believe. That's what lots yeah. of people will believe. Um, and it would be kind of weird to lots of people if Jesus was God, that God was in, incarnate. That would be kind of weird, you know, God entering into his creation. But you're stuck with an even bigger problem of God entering into his creation and then having a God. So how, yeah. how could you reconcile this? One of the most, I mean, if we were to make a list of the, the top two or three most difficult things in Christianity, this would be it. How can you... The mere Sam Shamoon hoped to uh -huh. deal with this issue. Well, uh, like I said uh, before I started, I admit my limitations because we're dealing with a being that's incomprehensible. However, that doesn't mean that this being hasn't given us an answer. There is an answer to this quote unquote, you know, paradox, uh, but it doesn't mean we're going to fully comprehend it. So I admit right off the bat, the Bible has an answer, but it's an answer that I don't think anyone. This side of eternity or even eternity itself, with the exception of God, because only God can figure out God fully and completely, will be able to fully understand the response. And the response is simply this, and I'm going to back it up by quoting the Bible, because our authority is scriptures. It's not philosophy. Uh, it's not logic. I mean, there's a place for philosophy and logic. But first and foremost, we need to exegete the scriptures. Go to the God-breathed revelation to see what God says in his word, and then see if we can understand it or explain it in such a way that will make sense to us. And again, no matter how much we try, we are limited, and God is beyond our comprehension. So I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm going to have to repeat this for our audience, especially for the Muslims listening. God is beyond our comprehension. So there is an answer, but it doesn't mean you'll fully understand it. But just because you can't fully understand it, that's no grounds to reject it. Because if that's the case, you're going to have to reject all of the monotheistic religions that teach that God is incomprehensible and unlike anything in creation. Now, let me just give the answer, and then we need to go into the biblical data, though. The Bible doesn't simply say that Jesus Christ is fully God in essence. It says that he's fully God in essence, who actually became a flesh and blood human being at a point in time. In fact, the classic passage for this is the Gospel of John, specifically the prologue, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. But since we don't have all the time in the world to read all 18 verses, I'll ask my brother C.L. Edwards if he can turn to John chapter 1 and read the first four verses for us. To begin with, let's look at the Gospel of John chapter 1, the first four verses, and see what the inspired author had to say about the person of Christ. Amen. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. I like the translation. I believe you're reading, if I'm not mistaken, the New American Standard Bible, correct? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, 
And uh, the reason why I knew it was the New American Standard Bible because it actually does the best job of translating the Greek verse of, of uh, 3, John 1, 3. Can you read John 1, 3 one more time? It's speaking of Christ in his pre-human existence as the eternal word of God the Father. Okay. What does it say about Christ the Word in his pre-human existence? Verse 3. One more time. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now here John says, Christ in his pre-human existence, before he became flesh, was the Word and still is the Word, in perfect communion with God, meaning God the Father, and that he, as the Word, is fully God in essence. And then in verse 3 he says something quite extraordinary quite astonishing he says that this was the word that brought everything into being that has come into being in other words every created thing owes its existence to the word of god that word being jesus so now let me ask you gentlemen a question if the word is the agent that god the father used to bring every created thing into existence can the word be part of creation can the word be a creature if he is the one that God used to bring all creation into being. No. The word Why not? preceded the creation. Because he brought the, the creation didn't exist until the word went forth. And brought it into being, right? So in other words, logically, the word had to have existed before all creation because he's the one who brought all creation into being. Exactly. Common sense. And that's not just common sense. That's just the plain reading of the text. Now, if that's the case, that means John has just told us Christ is not part of creation. He is uncreated. And since only God is uncreated, that means Jesus must be fully God. Now, if you don't mind, scroll down to verses 9 and 10 real quickly. Let's unpack this so we can answer the question. Why does Jesus have a God when he's eternal and fully God himself? Does that mean there are two gods? Well, biblically, no, there's only one God, so we can never say there are two gods. So if there are only one God, then how can Christ, who is eternal and fully God, have a God? We're going to see the answer from both John and Hebrews, as well as the totality of the scriptures. But we need to take it one point at a time. Verses 9 and 10, chapter 1, what does it say? Verses 9 and 10. It says, there was the light, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Hallelujah. He, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Notice the descriptions here. This is language that even from a Muslim perspective can only be attributed to God Almighty. It says that Christ is the true light that comes to the world. In other words, Christ is the source of all illumination. You cannot say that of any creature, no matter how exalted, especially if you're a committed monotheist like John. John was a monotheist. He believed there's only one God. And yet this John could say of Jesus that he is the true light, the agent that brought all creation into being, the one who made the world and entered the world that he made. Quite astonishing descriptions that John is lavishing on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know it's Jesus? It didn't say Jesus. It said the Word. He's a true light. He enters the world. He made the world. He brought all created things into existence. But how do we know it's Jesus? It doesn't say Jesus. It says the Word. It doesn't even say Son. We know that this is describing Christ because of verse 14. What does verse 14 say? Verse 14? Yes. And the Word became flesh and the dwelled among what? us. The Word did what? Became flesh hmm. and, dwelled and dwelled among us. us. Literal translation, by the way, those of you who read the Greek, you, can, you don't even need to know the Greek. I'm no Greek scholar. Uh, we know Dr. James White is, and Lord bless him, and use him mightily. But you can look at any commentary or look at a lexical source. When it says, dwelt among us, Actually, go back and look at the word. It means pitched his tent or tabernacled among us. Hmm. Meaning the word took on flesh to make that flesh the tabernacle, the temple of the living God. God lived in that body fully and completely. This is how we know it's Jesus. He's the word who became flesh. Now notice he's not just eternal. He's not just the agent of creation. He's not just fully divine. He's also flesh. In other words, a true flesh and blood human being. It is from that moment that when Jesus became flesh, and I may have to repeat this several times because I know this is going to be very complex for us to understand. And that's not just true of the audience, that's true of me as well. Just because I'm sharing with you the answer doesn't mean I fully comprehend it. I don't. I'm limited and, I'm, and I get puzzled and baffled when I read these passages, but that's to be expected because my God 
baffles the minds of everyone because he's just amazing. He's just majestic. With that said, the reason why Jesus has a God is because he became flesh. The moment Jesus entered into creation, the moment Jesus took on a created nature, the nature of, of man, the moment he took on flesh, from that moment on, the Father began relating to him as his God. I'll repeat that one more time. If you guys want me to clarify, ask me, say, Sam, what do you mean? I'm getting confused here. It is only from the moment of the incarnation, when Christ became man, and therefore part of creation, that the Father began relating to Christ as his God. Now, why is that? Well, if you go to Jeremiah 32, 27, you'll see why that is. Jeremiah 32, 27 says that Yahweh is the God of all flesh. That's the little translation of the Hebrew. Now, I may say the God of all mankind. That's more of a paraphrase. But it actually says Yahweh is the God of all flesh. And maybe CL can turn there and read the entire verse. Jeremiah 32, 27. Okay, one second. Is it 27 or 37? No, 27. 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Did you catch that, CL? Yes. Yahweh is the God of all flesh. So let me ask both of you a question, especially our brother David, whom the Lord blessed with a brilliant mind, and he happens to be a philosopher and a logician. If Yahweh is the God of all flesh, and Yahweh's triune, as we believe on the basis of Scripture, and one of the persons of Yahweh, of God, became flesh. Should it shock us and surprise us that the other member of God, specifically the Father, would begin relating to that particular person of the God who became flesh, would start relating to him as his God? In other words, if Jesus is fully God, second person of the Godhead, and he alone becomes flesh, should it shock us that the Father, who remains unembodied, he didn't become flesh, would begin relating to Jesus as his God. No, it would have to as soon as the word became flesh. Exactly. Spawn on that a little bit, my brother. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the one keep talking, so I want to give you guys some time to talk. Man. All right, Sam, we, uh, Sam, we have to go to a quick break, okay. and, and we'll come back and let you continue your case. We'll be back in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. All right. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We're discussing um, one of the most difficult issues to explain in Christianity and what Muslims would regard as one of their best objections against Christianity. Christians believe Jesus is God. Christians believe Jesus prayed and bowed down to God. But is that two gods? What's going on here? We've been talking about uh, the incarnation so far, and CL, you wanted to add a point about uh, the verse in, in John 1. Oh, yes, uh, well, John 14. John I wanted, 14. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John 1, 14. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, um, I wanted you to kind of go unpack the idea of tabernacle. Why is that significant? Sam, Sam, just yeah. so you know, CL is waiting to take you to school. <laughs> on yeah. why it says he tabernacled. Are you ready for this? Sure, school me. I need it. Uh, no, no, no. What, 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 do you, what do you think about the verse? And then he's going to take you to school. Yeah. Uh, the reason why he speaks of Christ uh, tabernacling in the flesh, because John is, is echoing the Old Testament, uh, where Yahweh <clears throat> would, f would fill the tent of meeting with his glory. If you read Exodus 33, mm -hmm. 7 to 11, and if you go to Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38, when Yahweh commanded the Israelites to construct, construct what he called the tent of meeting, right? Mm -hmm. That was the place where Yahweh would descend and meet with Moses and speak to him face to face. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. In fact, if you go to Exodus 33 and Exodus 40, it says that the tent was filled with his glory. Because Yahweh descended visibly in a cloud and filled it with the cloud. And the Israelites saw that as God filling the place with his glory. That's why it's not a coincidence in verse 14 where it says that the word became flesh, pitched his tent or tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory. Do you see the connection there? Yes. Beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only of the Father, full of grace and truth. Another allusion to, to the encounter with Moses in the tent of meeting. But even beyond that, if you go to John chapter 2, verses 19 and 22, Jesus Christ clearly describes his physical body as the living temple of God. What do I mean? If you go to John 2, 19 and 22, it says, he says, our Lord, our blessed Lord and Savior says, 
destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Now the Jews thought he was talking about the second temple, right? And I said, it's taken 46 years to build it, yet you will raise it up in three days? Then John gives us an explanation, a commentary on what Jesus meant. He goes, the temple he was speaking about was his body. Hmm. So you make the connection. Jesus says, when you destroy this body, you're destroying the temple. But I will raise it back again, never to be destroyed. So quite clearly, the physical body, the flesh body of Christ, has now become the permanent abode, the living temple, the living tabernacle of the living God. And all the fullness of deity resides in it. Exactly what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. In Colossians 2, 9, it says, In Him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of deity bodily. Another connection with Christ and the tent of meaning and the tabernacle slash temple. Remember what I said in Exodus 33 and Exodus 40, the cloud would descend upon the tent and would fill it with the cloud. And the Israelites saw that as God filling the place with his glory. That also took place when Solomon finished building the temple in Jerusalem. If you go to 1 Kings 8, after finishing the temple and devoting it to God, it says that Yahweh descended in the cloud and filled the place with the cloud. And the author takes that as Yahweh filling it with his glory. Now, if you go to the Mount of Transfiguration, if you go to the Mount of Transfiguration, light of what I just said, that Jesus said concerning his physical body. His physical body is the tent, the tabernacle, the temple of the living God. In the Mount of Tr Transfiguration, what envelopes, or en uh, how, do you, how would you say it, Dave? Because I know you love the way I pronounce words. Envelops. That's a problem <laughs> when someone learns everything from books. You never hear it. You have to learn from listening to me speak, Sam. Thank you, sir. That's why All God right. brought you in my life. You know, I've appreciated the moments uh, when I'm alone away from you even more than ever before. But anyway, uh, 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 when, however you said it, the cloud descended upon Christ and his three disciples, and a voice was heard, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Is that a coincidence? Just like the cloud descended on the tent of meaning, just like the cloud descended upon the temple, here we have the cloud of God descending upon Christ because his physical body, his flesh, has now become the permanent abode, the living, indestructible temple, tent of the living God. Hope that answered your question. Amen, amen. Uh, CL, I didn't know he was going to go into all that. I thought you were about to take him to school. I, bought, I thought he was about to give some horrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were going to take him to school. What do you think? Uh, we got to come up with something else. All right. All right, Sam, by the end of the show, we're going to stump you. We're, we're dead serious. We're going to hit you with something. All right? <laughs> now, Seal, you, 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 had a, you had a question for him as well, yes, right? This is, this, is a, this is a Muslim objection. Muslim. It was a Muslim objection, so we're giving you a Muslim objection, right? It's, we're bringing this up because it ties directly into what you were just saying before the break. Okay. Yes. This is from Shakur, who I've been talking to, and I told to tune into the show if he's uh, listening, watching. And Shakur wants to know, especially in light of what you just said about, you know, Yahweh being the God of all flesh, yeah. And the word incarnating into flesh, so yes. that makes uh, you know the Father his God during the time he's on earth. If yeah. Jesus is God, yes. If Jesus is God, God yes. is supposed to have authority. So how sure. can he submit to someone else? How can someone have authority over God? God yeah. submitted to God, who has authority yeah. over God. You don't see the problem here, Sam? Uh, actually, I don't because I don't assume Unitarianism. It is true if you have a singular consciousness who is God, a single person who is God, you can say, how can God ha receive authority from anyone? But let's assume for a moment that God is triune. Let's just assume for a moment. I'm not saying believe it. Assume for a moment you have three distinct persons, fully God, sharing the same divine essence, full and equally. One of, the, one of whom relates to the other as a son. <clears throat> Should it surprise us that because of that relationship of father and son, there would be some type of subjection on the part of one to the other. That's number one. Number two, Christ becomes flesh in order to assume the role and position of a servant. Whose servant? In fact, let me just back that up. I don't want your friend to think I'm just making this up, that I'm just coming up with explanations that are convenient. I try to base my explanations on the sound interpretation of the Bible. While on earth did Christ function in his role as king? Or did he set aside his divine prerogatives as king in order to assume the status of a servant? 
Now, I won't quote Paul, because if I go to Paul, Paul clearly says in Philippians 2, 7, that the Lord Jesus made himself nothing by taking on the form of a servant. But your friend may say, well, that's Paul, the great corrupt of Christianity. Show me Jesus. Okay, let me, let me show you Jesus. Did Jesus claim that while on earth, he was functioning in the status, the role of a servant? Yes. Go to Mark 10, 45, the earliest of our Gospels. Now, C.L. or David, one of you can read that. Mark 10, 45. What does our Lord say about his position, his role, while on earth? Someone read it. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give him his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus clearly says that he has come to serve others in fulfillment of whose will? The Father's will. The Father will that the Son would become flesh in order to assume the status, the position of a servant to accomplish the Father's will in saving the people of God. So now, if he's in the status of a servant, surely we expect a servant to be subject to his master. Now, here's the problem with, with your friend's objection. The assumption is that if you're subject to another, that means you're necessarily inferior in essence. Hmm. That's a reflection of our fallen state, our fallen condition, more so than a reflection of, of biblical theology or even Quranic theology. And what do I mean by that? Children are subject to their parents. Does that mean they're inferior in essence and value to their kids? David, you have four boys. The Lord bless them and grant them long life and salvation. Amen. Your boys are subject to you. Does that mean they're less human than you? No, less valuable? Every, have no, less dignity? Every, every, bit is human. every bit is human. How can that be? They're subject to you. Can't be. It doesn't make sense. How do you answer that? Because this is what we call a categorical mistake. You're assuming function equates to essence. You can have two distinct individuals who are equal in essence, but not necessarily equal in function or status or position. So this is a categorical mistake. Just because I'm subject to my father doesn't mean I'm inferior to my father in essence, nature, dignity, and value. Likewise, just because Jesus is subject to the father by virtue of being the divine son, and also by virtue of becoming flesh, becoming man, doesn't mean that he's inferior to the Father in essence, nature, dignity, or value, especially when the same scriptures say Jesus is fully God and shares in the same divine glory and majesty of the Father. Now, let me prove that assertion. Do I have time to prove these assertions, by the way? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, go, go ahead and uh, wait. How long are you going to take? Well, I, I didn't do a, a thorough job on how, he, how could Jesus have a God, but that's the nature of a, a live call-in show. But let me just quickly give some more references to Shakur's question. Okay. Let me show you another reference where Jesus clearly says that while on earth, he's in the status of a slave, status of a servant. Do me, again, do me a favor again, CL. Go to Luke 22, 27. Either one of you, doesn't matter. Whoever turns there. Thank God for modern technology, which allows us to turn to Bible verses in a nanosecond. Can you imagine trying to look through it you know, if you had a hard copy? Uh -uh. Luke 22, 27. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. So I just proved my case from the words of Christ. While on earth, he's in the status of a servant. So let me ask you, CL. If mm -hmm. Jesus is clearly telling you that on earth, I've assumed the role, the status of a servant, should it surprise you being the servant of his father, he's subject to the father? No, that's... What he would do That's if to be expected, that right? On. Yeah. Thank you. Now, what does Jesus say that he's worthy of the same divine glory, honor, dignity, and majesty that the Father, the Father has and receives? John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, and I'll read that. John 5, 22 to 23. As we look at John 5, 20 to 22 to 23, if one of you can turn to John 17, verse 5, and read that right after me. John 17, verse 5, one of you can read that. Let me first quote John 5, 22 to 23. And I want, I want your friend Shakur to tell me whether this is compatible with Islamic theology. Does this comport with Islamic theology? Notice what Jesus says. John 5, 22 to 23. Moreover, furthermore, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the sons. Here we see the Father giving the Son this role. Does that imply the Son is in fear in essence? No way. Because then Jesus goes on and explain why the Father gave him this role. What, what's the reason? The Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son so that, here's the reason, all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Did you catch that? 
Jesus is saying that the reason why my father appointed me to judge all flesh and determine the eternal destiny of every single individual, which, by the way, includes Muhammad. Jesus will judge everyone, including Muhammad, and determine their eternal destiny. The reason why the father appointed him judge of all is so that every single individual honors Christ the same way they honor the father. Notice what he did not say. He didn't say, honor me as a prophet. Honor me as you honor your parents. Honor me, honor me as a great moral teacher. No, you honor me the way you honor the Father, which would be blasphemy if he's a creature. Because the way we honor the Father is that we love him wholeheartedly, seek to obey him perfectly, sing to him, pray to him, live in perfect obedience to his commands, and even be willing to die for him and give up everything for him. That kind of devotion can only be given to God. You cannot give it to a creature. But Jesus says, I'm worthy of that same honor and devotion. Now, CL, being a former Salafi, knowing Tawheed and Ibadah, Tawheed and Eluhia, where only Allah is to be worshipped in this manner, does Jesus' statement comport with Islamic theology? And does this sound like a Muslim Jesus? No, that does not sound like Isa ibn Maryam. Isa ibn Maryam doesn't receive any ibadah, any worship at all. He just points to Allah, who's supposed to be the one who receives so, the worship in ibadah. So let me ask you another question, CL. I, if, since Jesus did demand this kind of worship, we're left with one of two p positions, aren't we? Either he's a creature and he's blaspheming, mm -hmm. and therefore he can't be a man worthy of respect, let alone a true prophet, or Jesus thinks that he's more than a man, that he's God in the flesh, and proved it by rising from the dead. Do we have a third option? I wouldn't think so. Um, what would be the third option? There, there is no well, third option. Oh, your Bible's corrupt. No. Your Bible's corrupt. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Well. So you. So I he hope that answers the question. got you there, CL. He got you there. Your Bible's corrupt, dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But then we can, then then David can just bring bring out the Islamic dilemma, baby. If our Bible's corrupt, that's more proof that Islam is false. And now we've discussed that in the past, and we can discuss it in the future. But the Quran quite clearly says our scriptures are the uncorrupt words of God. So that argument won't work for a Muslim. Mm -hmm. So they're left with only one option. Accept the fact that the historical Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh and worthy of the same honor that the Father receives, mm -hmm. which nullifies Islam. Mm -hmm. All right, Sam, uh, before we move on, we want to get to, uh, we, we don't want to call we had to leave a lot of callers hanging on the last program. We don't want them to build up too much on uh, this show. So let's take a caller. Uh, I believe we have Eric on the line. Oh, hi, David. Hi, how you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm great. Um, well, just to add a, a little bit about the, um, you, you know, Sam's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sam's explanation on the Heavenly Father. Uh, I just heard a sermon uh, from a priest, uh, basically, like last Sunday. Basically, um, Jesus was uh, trying to explain, uh, for example, if you want to understand God, like if you, nobody can explain uh, like who God really is, is basically like uh, explaining like how do you explain the color red, for example, to a blind man, which will be uh, difficult. So, you know, you can just like use parables and stuff. So e even then, like uh, it will be, it will be, it will be like uh, for our finite mind. It will be really, really difficult for us to actually understand God, despite like uh, like a lot of the explanations. Um, and finally, uh, my question relates to you know during Jesus' crucifixion, uh, any any reason why he said like uh, Father, why did you forsake me? Uh, yeah, can can you answer that one, and uh, I'll give yeah. the answer of the uh, light thing. Yeah, actually, we're gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Sam respond to that. I just want to point out, I think a, a very uh, very important. I don't want people, I don't want people to miss uh, the importance of uh, the first issue you brought up as far as explaining God, right? Because we're trying to we're trying to explain uh, the doctrine of the Trinity the best we can. And Muslims just object it. No, no, no. Show me something that that's that's like that. Uh, but think about what the brother just said. How would you explain the color red to a person who can't see and has never seen? The problem is in order to even understand red, you have to have some experience. You have to have a visual experience. You have to be able to see red. In other words, you can't know what it is until you have a direct sensory experience of it. 
Now, that's true with various concepts. There are certain things we can't understand without experiencing them directly. And so the Muslim is saying, uh, I want to understand God. And we have no direct experience of God. And that's why my friends who are Muslims, it's not just the doctrine of the Trinity that we find difficult to comprehend. I find all, all of God's attributes difficult to comprehend. If you really think about uh, God's attributes, how can something be... Uh, eternal. What's God doing for all eternity? Is he playing checkers? What's he doing? I used to wonder that. I said that because I used to wonder that when I was a kid, when people would tell me about God. Uh, so I find all kinds of things about God to be difficult to understand. How can God be immaterial? How can God think and be immaterial? How can he think and not have eyes? How can these things possibly be true? The, we can't understand them. I don't understand at all how God can see unless he has some eyeballs. Everything I've ever experienced in my life that can see has eyeballs. So how can God be different? Well, well, if that's what God reveals to us, that that's how he is, then we have to accept it or we have to reject it. And Muslims, uh, you turn to the Christian doctrine of God and you say, I don't get that, therefore it's not true. And you don't realize you don't get almost anything in your concept of God. Why don't you apply the same standards? Because you can't. You can't apply the same standards to Christianity and Islam, or you'd have to leave Islam. All right, Sam, the brother asks, yeah. Jesus said something very strange on the cross if he's God. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's a good question, because that actually does tie in with a psalm that I wanted to discuss. However, uh, I don't know how much time we have, because this, this question itself would entail an entire episode. Why did Jesus cry out? And he didn't say, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you can find that in Mark 15, 34 and Matthew 27, 46. Now, for me to do justice to this passage, I need at least 20 minutes. But real quickly, you actually read the context. It says that darkness fell on the, fell on the land <clears throat> excuse me, from noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, uh, you may read a translation where it say from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now, that's Jewish time. Sixth hour, according to the Jews, would be noon hour time. Ninth hour would be three o'clock in the afternoon. And so basically, darkness covered land from noon to three. Anyone familiar with the Old Testament would know that this was a sign of God's judgment. God's judgment was being poured out. Now, where do I find the proof of this? Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10. If you go to Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 10, and if you look at Exodus 10, 21 to 23, it talks about darkness covering the land in Exodus 10 for three days. And in Amos 8, 9 to 10, God tells the Israelites, he's going to make the sun go down at noon, and he's going to make it completely pitch dark, and he's going to turn their feasts into mourning, mourning as for an only son, because he's fed up with their sins. So did you catch that? Darkness at noon during your feast times, as an indication that God's wrath is being poured out upon the people, causing them to mourn for their wickedness, and their mourning will be as a mourning for an only son. Now let's, let's do the math here. Let's tie in all these points. Okay. This was the feast of the Jews when Jesus was crucified. It was the feast of the Passover. Darkness came upon the land at noon, and here was God's only son on the cross, bearing the wrath and punishment of God in our place. Do you see that? In other words, it wasn't a coincidence that darkness fell upon the land at noon because that would be an indication to anyone familiar with the Bible that judgment has now fallen on someone or something. In the context, judgment fell on who? Who was the one being judged? Can you guys help me out? Jesus Christ. Why? Why would the sinless Lamb of God be judged? Because he's the sin bearer. Help me understand bearer. this, Christian. What was it? He's the one who came to bear the sins. Thank you. As our substitute, he bears the wrath of God fully and satisfy God so that God can look upon us with favor. Now, why does he cry out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Well, if you're familiar with your Bible, there are two main reasons. Number one, he's citing the opening words of Psalm 22, 22.1. 22 if you read Psalm 22.1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The context of the psalm, is the cry, a plea from the righteous servant who is suffering unjustly, committing himself to God, trusting that God would come to deliver him and vindicate him. In other words, Psalm 22 starts off with a cry of despair, but ends with rejoicing 
because the righteous servant who's suffering unjustly is vindicated by God. Jesus chooses those words because those words find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. He is the one who suffers unjustly because of our sins, something he volunteers to do. Now that he's born the wrath of God, <clears throat> he cries out with the words of Psalm, not as a cry of despair, but a cry of, how long must I endure the wrath? <clears throat> how far will you be from my suffering? In other words, Father, I have satisfied your wrath. I have borne your, your <clears throat> judgment on behalf of others. My vindication draws nigh. That's why it's not a coincidence that when Jesus cries out those words at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the darkness disappears. Is everyone with me? Can someone explain to me the connection with Jesus crying out those words and darkness disappearing? If darkness signifies judgment, and Jesus is crying out with the words of Psalm, which is a plea to be vindicated, to be delivered from the suffering that the person didn't deserve, is it a coincidence that when he cries out these words, the darkness vanishes? What would that be an indication of? Can you guys help me? Someone? The, remo the removal of the, the ending of the judgment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The removal of the wrath of God, mm -hmm. the darkness disappearing means God is now satisfied. Jesus has borne the full punishment of God in our place. And now he cries out, vindicate me, deliver me, because I have now accomplished your will. And the Father responds positively, and the sign of the Father's response is that he removes the darkness, meaning the judgment has passed. God has now been propitiated. Now, if I have just less than a minute, the other reason why he cries out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, how many of you are familiar with the fact that according to the Old and New Testament, <clears throat> the Jews were commanded to observe the morning and evening sacrifices daily, daily in the temple, the Jews would offer the morning and evening sacrifices. The morning sacrifices took place nine in the morning, the third hour. The evening sacrifice, which was also the time of prayer, by the way, people would go to the temple and pray as the priest offered the morning and evening sacrifices. The time of evening prayer, the time of evening pr uh, sacrifice would be three in the afternoon. Is it a coincidence that according to Mark 15, 25, Jesus was crucified nine in the morning, the third hour, which was the time of the morning sacrifice. Is that a coincidence? I would think not. Nothing in the scripture okay. is a coincidence. Now, is it a coincidence then that Jesus cries out with the words of, the, of Psalm 22 at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, which was the time of the evening sacrifice and prayer? Now, to confirm that this was the time of evening sacrifice and prayer, if you go to Acts 3.1, it says that Peter and John went to the temple at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, afternoon to do what? To pray, Acts 3.1. It's right there, you can read it. Acts 3.1 says, Peter and John went up to the temple at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon to pray in the temple because it was a time of evening sacrifice. What's my point? Jesus on the cross is not simply a victim. He's also the high priest who's offering himself as a sacrifice for his people. That's why it's not a coincidence that as the high priest, he cries out with the words of Psalm 22 at the ninth hour because he's functioning as our priest, offering an evening sacrifice and crying out with the Psalm 22, which is what the Jews would do. The Psalms are written to be sung in the temple. Jesus was acting as our priest as well as our sacrifice. That's why he was crucified during the, the third hour, nine in the morning, morning sacrifice, and he cries out with the words of Psalm 22 at the ninth hour, three o'clock afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice. Now you tell me that's a coincidence, gentlemen. Hmm. So basically, you. if you wanted to sum it up, you're telling us that all these things were done on purpose. Jesus yep. wasn't just a victim of circumstance. Amen. Hallelujah. Exactly. All right, guys, we have, to, uh, we have to take a quick break. We'll come back, and uh, if Sam needs to wrap anything up with that, then we'll go on to some callers, and then we can continue uh, with our topic here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. Sam, I know you have a lot more to say on this issue, but uh, we have a few callers. One of them is from Singapore. One of them is uh, a Muslim, so uh, we want to get to these now. We don't want to keep someone from Singapore waiting on the, the phone all day. So, oh, did that... Did they, did they quit waiting? 
Oh, man. Hey, you from Singapore. You viewer from Singapore. Call us right back. We'll, we'll put you uh, directly through. Even if I have to cut Sam off in the middle of a sentence, which I love doing, uh, we'll put you back on the line. Sorry about that. All right, who do we have on the line next? Hussein, can you hear us? Hello. Hello hey. to all of you guys. Hi, how you doing? I am doing good. You know, I have my comment is you say Jesus is God. Where is Ibrahim? Ibrahim is God too. Uh, could you repeat that, please? I said, if Jesus is God, where is Ibrahim? Ibrahim is God too. What, why would why would Ibrahim be God? I, why be why be Jesus God? Why do we think that Jesus is God? Because you he claimed said, because he claimed to be God. Ibrahim didn't claim to be God. Jesus never be God. Jesus what? Jesus is not God. Uh, why do you believe that, sir? This is what I believe. I know you believe it. I asked you why. I, I, I asked you why you believe it. We spend all these shows explaining why we believe what we believe. I, I, I like to explain to you if Jesus God can all people and all be Christian. Uh, my friend, you're, uh, was, uh, I don't even understand. I don't understand the objection. I, if Jesus, if, I, Je if Jesus is God, what? One more time. Okay. Yes. I said Jesus is not God. I know what but you said. Jesus, we asked you for evidence. Jesus, you haven't given us any. Hey, Dave. If Jesus, if Jesus, he become God, can he make all people and all be Christian? If hey, Jesus, no, notice, notice, yeah, yeah, careful, and I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let Sam uh, add yeah. something. But think about what he just said. If Jesus is God, can he make all people Christian? The answer is, uh, he could make all people Christian, just as if Allah were God, he could make all people Muslim. So follow the reasoning here. Uh, if Jesus were Christian, he could make all, I mean, if Jesus were God, he could make all people Christian. But he hasn't made all people Christian, therefore Jesus is not God. Well, following the same reasoning that our Muslim friend just brought up, if Allah is God, could he make all people Muslim? Well, yes, he could, but he hasn't made all people Muslim. Therefore, Allah is not God. You didn't refute our belief, my friend. You just refuted your own. Sam, what thank do you think? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank uh, you so much Dave. to you. Okay. Thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Thank you're welcome. very much for the question. Um, because time is running out, can you hear me, Dave, by the way? Yeah, yeah, we got you. Yeah, because time is running out, there's one aspect of the argument that I need to address because we did talk about how is it Jesus could have a God <clears throat> Uh, if he's fully God. We said because of the incarnation, because of the flesh. Right. However, part of the objection to that that's typically raised by Muslims, this is part of the objection. I do need to answer that for the sake of our Christian brothers and sisters who may get stumped. Jesus still has a God in glory. It's not simply on earth the Father beca became his God. Even now in glory, Jesus has a God, his Father. Now, where are we getting this from? If you go to the book of Revelation, Dave, either you or CL can read the following passages for me, if you don't mind. Uh, can one of you read Revelation chapter 1, verse 6? Now remember, this is the glorified Christ. Christ has now entered his exalted status, <clears throat> state. <clears throat> he's in a state of glory. He sits in throne as king of kings and lord of lords, but he still has a God. Now how do we respond to that? I won't take an hour to respond to it, but I do need to respond to it nonetheless because that's part of the objection. So if someone can read Revelation 1, 6 for me. <clears throat> And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to the to his God and Father. To him be his glory. His God and Father. His God Did you and see Father. that in verse 6? Speaking of Jesus, his God and Father. So Jesus still has a God who's his Father, even though he's in glory, sitting and throne as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, CL, do me a favor. Turn to Revelation 3, verse 2 and verse 12. Revelation 3, verse 2 and verse 12. So read verse 2 and skip to verse 12. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2 and verse 12. Because we need to answer this. Many Christians may be surprised with this answer because I've often asked uh, this question of Christian audiences that I've spoken to, that I've had the privilege to speak with. I've asked them a question. Is Jesus still a man in heaven? And will he remain a man forever? In some of these audiences, I get the answer, no. And these are from committed Christians who've been in the faith for, for a while. So I need to address this so that we can understand what the Bible actually says. 
about Jesus in his post-resurrection uh, <clears throat> status. Is he still full human, or is he simply God who's no longer human? We need to address that, because that will answer this objection. See, I'll read for me Revelation 3, verse 12, and uh, Revelation 3, verse 2, I'm sorry, and skip to verse 12. Read that okay. for me. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. That's Jesus speaking, speaking to the church, my God. Now, verse 12, he refers to having a God four times. Notice how many times Jesus will say, my God. Verse 12, same chapter 3, verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he One. will not go out. And he Keep will going. not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God. Two. In the city of my God. And Three. the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. And my Four. new name. Wow. Four times Jesus says he has a God. Okay. Well, how does that work? Okay. I understand he became flesh on earth. And when he became flesh, the father who didn't become flesh began relating to him as his God. Because God... By nature is the God of all flesh. Since only Christ became flesh, then we can see how the Father could begin relating to the Son as his God from that moment on. But what about now in glory? Well, the answer is very simple. And Dave knows this, CL knows this, and any serious Bible student knows this. Jesus is still a flesh and blood human being, or if you want to say, flesh and bone human being in heaven. Jesus did not cease to exist as a man, with a physical body after the resurrection. In fact, the word resurrection implies a physical body came back to life. So the answer is simple. Although he's in glory, he's still a man, albeit a glorified man, with a glorified fleshly body. Now, lest someone says that I'm making that up because the Bible doesn't see it, for the sake of time, I'm going to look at some references. Luke 24, verses 36 to 43. I won't read all of it. We'll look only at a few. For the sake of time, we'll look at Luke 24, verses 36 to 43, specifically 37 to 39. I'll just look at 37 to 39 real quickly. After the resurrection, does Jesus still have a flesh body? A body made incorruptible, immortal. Yes, let me read. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He, Jesus, said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. So Jesus has hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Crystal clear. After the resurrection, Jesus still has a flesh and bone body. Why? Because he's still a man, albeit a glorified man. A man who will never see decay again with a glorified physical body. Again, because time is fleeting. Let's go to Acts 2. 30 to 32. Acts 2, 30 to 32. We'll look at two more references after this, and then we'll take callers, because I know we don't have much time. But this is a vitally important point. Christians need to know this. Our belief on the basis of Scripture teaches Christ in heaven and forever is a man, a glorified man, with a physical, fleshly body that's incorruptible. So he's still the God-man. Acts 2, 30 to 32. <clears throat> Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, Preaching on Pentecost says the following. But he, meaning David, was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, God revealed to David the future, the future about the Messiah, his physical son. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, meaning Hades, nor did his flesh see decay. Now let me ask David and Ciel a question. How did God prevent Jesus' flesh from decaying? And by the way, the Greek word is flesh, sarx. Some translations translated body, but the Greek word for body is soma. Here it doesn't use the word soma, it uses the Greek word sarx. So my question to both of you gentlemen is this. How did God prevent the flesh body of Jesus from decaying? He resuscitated, he resurrected him from the grave and gave him a glorified body. Gave him, or he raised that body and made it glorious. Well, I, I think I would correct that. He resurrected yes, that so, same body that died, and that body became glorified. 
So in other words, if Jesus was raised with that physical fleshly body, then what does that tell us? That he's still human, right? Yes. So yes. if he's still human, he's still flesh, will the Father continue to be his God even after the resurrection? Yahweh is the God of all flesh. And if Jesus still exists as flesh and will continue to exist as flesh forever by virtue of the resurrection, will the Father at any time cease being his God? No. Exactly. Now again, because our time is fleeting, let me look at these final references. Acts 17, 30 to 31. Paul preaching. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands. And by the way, Acts 17, 30 to 31. For those of you writing, that, writing this down, as you can see, I'm trying to rush through this because our time is fleeting. But I want to do justice to these verses. Acts 17, 30 to 31. He overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, not by a spirit, not by an angel, by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Again, a question for both of you guys. How can J Jesus judge the world as a man if he's no longer a man? Notice what Paul says. God has appointed this man whom he's raised from the dead to judge the world. How could Jesus judge the world as a man if he's not a man? Well, he couldn't. He has to still be a man. Thank you. So Jesus will ever, forever remain a man with a flesh and bone body. Again, the two final verses, and I think they're self-explanatory. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, talking about the current situation. Paul is writing this after the resurrection of Christ, and he's talking about his day, that this is true right now, not the past, right now and forever. And what is true? For there is one God, not there was one God. There is one God currently. And one mediator right now between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Notice Paul didn't simply say Christ Jesus or the angel Christ Jesus or the spirit Christ Jesus. No, the man Christ Jesus right now in heaven mediates for us. Well, the only way he can mediate as a man is if he's still a man. And then finally, finally from Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, Revelation twenty two sixteen, the last book in the last chapter, where Jesus in glory speaks to John, his servant, and he says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am, notice, present tense, not I was. Dave and C.L. notice this. Not I was, I am, right now in glory, the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. So here's a question for both of you guys. How in the world could Jesus say in glory to John, that right now in heaven, in glory, I still am the offspring of David. How? If he's not a man. He, 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 could, he couldn't. He has to be a man. He still has to be flesh. So he is he's a human being with a flesh body and still has an ancestor or ancestors. He still has a genealogy in heaven. And his genealogy connects him with David. So because he's still a man... With a flesh body in heaven, he is still David's descendant. So what's the answer to the question of Jesus still having a God in heaven? How could that be? Because Jesus is still flesh in heaven. He's still a man and will never cease to be a man with a flesh and bone body, a body that's incorruptible. So Dave, this is for you. If Jesus will continue to exist as a glorified man with a glorified, glorified flesh body forever, will the Father ever stop being his God? And why not? Uh, don't see how. All right. That was short and sweet to the point. So I had to get that point in before our time was up. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a caller real quick. Uh, who do we have on the line? Who do we have? Can you hear us? Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Excellent question, by the way. Just kidding. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> hello. Do you hear us? Yeah, this is John. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, buddy. Hey, John, what's up, brother? Yeah, you guys are really encouraging everyone. Appreciate that. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm taking a look at First Peter um, chapter 1, verse 10. If you could take a look at that. Yeah. Ben 11 and 12. Okay, what's the you specific question about, about that Peter. passage? He's talking about the Spirit of Christ and the prophets announced the sufferings and glory of Christ. What about it? 
Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about Peter at certain times, and I'm looking at verse 11. It says, searching what or what manner of time. This is really talking about how Jesus was, uh, there was prophecies about him suffering, and I think that's very important for people to understand that. And I think as far as Jesus being God, that's really the only way that anyone could ever be saved because he had to do it all. It's not about works. It's about God doing everything for us to be saved. Amen. You got no objection from me. I'm 100% on uh, uh, in the same boat, same camp with you, brother. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, Sam, in verse 10, it says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and search yep. diligently, how can we encourage Muslims to really search the prophets themselves? That way they can have an answer to what's in verse 9 of First Peter, uh, chapter yeah, 1, uh, 9. Okay, yeah, good question. Uh, Lord willing, in the, in the near future, we'll do shows on prophecies, Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus as proof the Old Testament is inspired by God, only God can accurately predict the future and have it perfectly come to pass as he's ordained. And that secondly, Jesus is, we claim to be, and whom the prophet said he would be. And how, how we can get Muslims to look into that? Well, Muslims value prophecy. What's the proof? They actually think that the Old and New Testaments predicts the coming of Muhammad. And so they go and pour throughout the Old and New Testament trying to find such predictions because they understand that if Muhammad is predicted, this validates his ministry. Well, if that's the case, if we can then point to the same scriptures and show prophecies that the Messiah would be God, that the Messiah would be the Son of God, that the Messiah would become flesh, that the Messiah would die for our sins. If we can show them that the prophets announced this in advance, then they have a dilemma in their hands. And what's the dilemma again? And you know, me and David love that word dilemma. Right? We're going to copyright that word. Everything is a dilemma for us. Dilemma this. Even eating sausage pizza at 12 at night is a dilemma. No, just, you know. All Problem, pizza. right? Yeah, yeah. So, sausage pizza, pan. It's not pan. You need to repent or I'll lay hands on you. Now, coming back to the issue at hand. <clears throat> the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures were in the possession of the Jews long before there were any Christians. If the Muslims want to say that the Old Testament was corrupted, why in the world would the Jews corrupt the Old Testament to perfectly agree with New Testament teaching? Why would the Jews agree with the Christians, or why would the Jews rewrite the Old Testament, the Revelation, in such a way where basically you can prove the Christian message from Old Testament prophecies? No Jew would allow any Christian to do that, and no Jew would do that. But the very fact that you can point to the Old Testament and show the Christian message announced hundreds, if not thousands of years, before the birth of Christ, is proof that these scriptures are not corrupt, they've been preserved, and that Christianity, taught in the New Testament, is the true religion, the true revelation, the true faith, revealed by God through the prophets, consummated by Christ, and proclaimed by his followers. So they have to take it seriously because they believe in the value of prophecy. Now maybe C.L. Edwards or David can add their two cents worth to that question. How can we get Muslims to take seriously the prophecies in the Old Testament about the sufferings, resurrection, and glory of the Christ. Well, I would just uh, add my little two cents. Uh, Christians need to know it themselves so you can disseminate Amen. and give the information to the Muslims. Um, one Amen. of the things that really uh, uh, opened my heart to Christianity were the prophecies in Isaiah, especially knowing that, you know, that copies of Isaiah had been found in the Quorum Cave a hundred years or so before Jesus was ever born, proving that these couldn't have been, you know, corrupted scriptures made by Paul and his Pauline Christians. These, these, <laughs> these, these words in, in Isaiah existed before that time, before Christ. And when you read Isaiah 53, who, is, who do you think it's talking about? Yeah, clear as day, my brother. In fact, can I share a true story along those lines? Sure. I won't take less than a minute. True story. I live in an hey, area where we hey, have... Hey, Sam, look at what you just said. I won't take less than a minute. So that could be like half an hour. <laughs> no, I meant to say I won't take uh, uh, any longer than, than a minute. That's what All I meant. Right. All right, that's better. Meant, that's better. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know you're the great corrector and editor of, of books and statements of people, you know? 
In fact, you know, there's no one like you. You're infallible. In fact, I want to find someone who can produce statements like you. You're a miracle. <laughs> I made you one like correction. Go ahead. I made one correction. All right. Why are you, why are you jumping all over story. me? Go ahead. This, true story. I live in an area where we have Orthodox Jews. I had a Christian buddy of mine. We went to the local Barnes and Nobles. There are two young Jewish boys that were in the religious section. I go, watch what I'm going to do. I took an English translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh. They call it the Tanakh. And I said, can I ask you gentlemen a question? Young men, they're teenagers. They go, sure. I want to read this, this, this uh, chapter from your scriptures, the Tanakh. It's Isaiah 53, your prophet. I want to read it. And I want you to tell me who it is. I read Isaiah 53, the entire chapter, and I stopped and I said, can you tell me who it is? Without hesitation, and I'm not lying, the Lord bear witness, that what I told you actually happened. The one young Jewish boy turned to the other in shock, turned back to me and says, that's Jesus, without hesitation. And then I told him, what is Jesus doing in your scriptures? Can you go ask your rabbi? That's how clear and plain Isaiah 53 is. And I encourage every Muslim, I challenge you, as well as Christian and Jew, go tonight and read Isaiah 53 in its entirety. And be honest with yourself and ask yourself, who could this be? If you're going to be honest to God and yourself, the only answer is Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, Sam, I, I don't know if, uh, well, I'm sure you do remember. You have a brain like a computer. Um, we were actually talking to... Uh, a young Muslim woman uh, locally here, and we had her read the passage for herself, right? We, we didn't, we didn't even read it to her. We added no commentary. We put it in front of her, said, read Isaiah 53. She read it, and we said, who's that talking about? She said, Jesus. Amen. That's right. Now, Amen. now how, how do you do that? How do you look at that? This is a prophecy. This is about Jesus, and you turn and walk away and don't accept him. How do you do that, right? Well, obviously, it had to be Paul and his evil followers who snuck <laughs> into the scriptures wrong, and put that in there. Wrong. Paul built a time machine. <laughs> yeah. This is our new explanation. Exactly. Paul had a time machine. He got in the time machine. He went back several hundred years. Uh, he corrupted Isaiah. He changed Isaiah. He changed all these things so that they predict Jesus' death, his resurrection, his deity. He, 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 Paul put all those in there with his, uh, with his time machine. We got, do, we have that, do we have this solved now? Do we have the problem solved? Yeah. That makes perfect sense, you know. And, hey, I believe it. After all, if you can believe a story like Satan staying in the upper part of your nose and you need to flush him out <laughs> with water three times, then I believe it, man. It's possible. Hey, or, or, or hey, hey it, it, it actually gets worse. Muslims believe that God deceived Jesus' followers into believing that he died by crucifixion if God would deceive them, maybe God put those scriptures, maybe God uh, yeah. gave Isaiah 53, maybe God rewrote Isaiah 53 to convince people that Jesus is going to die for their sins, because that's what he did anyway at the time of the crucifixion, right? Exactly. So Excellent. here's our new way of explaining Christianity, my Muslim friends. According to Islam, according to Islam, Allah tricked Jesus' followers into believing he died by crucifixion. Let's go ahead and explain uh, all the evidence that way, all the evidence we have is Christianity. Allah gave it all. Allah tricked everyone into believing these things. That uh, doesn't exactly make sense. You end up with a pretty weird God. But if that's what you have to do to reject Christianity, that's what you have to do. You have to believe something weird like that. All right, we have to take our final break, and we'll be back in just a moment with more Sam Shamoon here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to our final segment of Jesus or Muhammad tonight. We want to get to a couple of callers, and we hope they're going to stump Sam Shamoon. CL and I couldn't. Uh, but we know that somewhere here, don't just praise him because of his good looks. We know you callers want to call in and just agree with everything Sam says. We hope there's someone out there who's going to refute him, but let's check. Who do we have on the line? Hello? Hello. Yes, hello, this is Brenda. Uh, I just wanted to say to my uh, three Christian brothers out there, thank you so much, and we're so happy APN came back, and you three, and Pastor Joseph, you're doing such a wonderful job, and I want to say we really go out, you know, our heart really goes out to you, what you're doing for all those Muslim people out there trying to bring them to our Lord. And it, it's such a shame, you know, when I see it, so many Muslim people, they're either atheists, they truly don't have any belief, and they're just going under the, the title, say they're Islamic, because they really don't have any belief. And you talk to many of them, they don't have any answers to anything of what they truly believe in. 
and, it's not, and so you're trying to contradict them and to their belief, but they really don't have any belief. And then in the name of their Muhammad, they go and they do so many. Uh, the other ones that do violence, they're doing in the name of Muhammad, like you see the you know, bombings in Nigeria and other places and Egypt and all the things that they're doing. But the, they need to have a democracy of religion, but they're not having it. And so they're going out and doing these terrible violence under the name of, they say, Muhammad and Allah. Sometimes I just think that they're just truly the children of Lucifer, you know, and so when you bring them to our Lord, I say, well, God bless you for what you're doing, and I, I pray that somehow. I, I see on TV, on one of the channels, they had one Coptic priest that he was actually doing exorcism in the church on the Muslim people that had been becoming converted to Christianity, and I said, wow, you know, I wish that ABN could just throw, throw some type of exorcism through the air and catch all those people, make them to become Christian, get that devil's out of them. But uh, I, I thank you so much for what you're doing, and I hope you keep on keep up the good work, and that's why we, we're supporting you. Thank you so much. And I wish that they would have a democracy. I pray for them to have a democracy religion and that they all become Christians. Thank you so much, all my three Christian brothers over there. Thank you so much. Thank you, sister. We hope you'll uh, call again on our next show. Uh, who do we have next on the line? Hello, do you hear us? Hello? Hey. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Oh, wow, I can't believe I'm next. Uh, it's, it's very nice to meet you. You too. What's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I I've been watching your show on YouTube for a long time, and then it's like, I don't know, it's weird, like I'm talking to a celebrity right now, but uh, it's real good to meet you, and I, and I love what you guys are doing. Uh, praise the Lord, and maybe help you with uh, your, 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 whatever you're doing right here. Praise the Lord. Okay. Hey, did you have a, did you have a question or comment? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, What's up? I don't know if this is kind of off subject, but uh, it, it, it's something to do with Muslim and Christian uh, subject. Uh, why would God make, uh, you know, like children, like, you know, innocent children? Or why would he allow children go to be born into Muslim families, like, because children are blameless, and they will be born into Muslim families, and they have to grow up with this, and then at the end, at the, at, at the end of their lives, they will be uh, condemned to hell. But why will God do this? They were innocent, and from birth, yeah, they were uh, uh, raised with this. Dave. Why? Yeah. Dave. Yeah. You can hear me? Okay, that question's a good question, but we, do we have time to break it down? Uh, it's, like uh, angry. it's a, yeah, it's, friend, well, it's, de it's definitely on topic. So your call, do you yeah, want to, well, do you want to deal says, with, we got about 20 minutes left on the show. Do you want to deal with this? Okay. Or do you want to move on? Okay. If I, if I understood the question, you guys, and you're the philosopher, so you're more qualified in answering this. But if I understood the question, just so I don't, you know, address the question he didn't ask. He's asking basically Muslims, no fault of their own, no fault of their own were born into Muslim families, and they've been indoctrinated in Islam, and if they'll continue believing that, then they off the hell they go. Why is that? Is that his question? Yeah. Okay, now, now is he asking why did God allow them to be born to Muslim parents, or? It, it's just, because... hey, you, you, believe, you believe God is good, and then God's going to let children, uh, babies be born into Muslim families, and then those babies are going to not reject Jesus, and so... Why didn't he make all babies born in Christian families, I guess? The assumption is if, if you're born in a Christian home, you'll automatically turn to Jesus Christ. And that's not true. That's a false assumption. Uh, because we know many people who were born to Christian parents and still didn't follow Christ, but rebelled against, rebelled against Christ. In fact, Muslims boast that thousands of Christians every, every year become Muslim, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, so being born in a Christian home has its advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> so just because you're born in a Christian home doesn't mean that you're more likely to end up believing in Jesus and being saved. Now, <clears throat> what about people who are not born in Christian homes? Do they have a chance of being saved? And is it God's fault that they're born in Muslim homes? Well, if you actually read what the Bible says, it says God has placed everyone exactly where they're at, where they're at for a purpose. So lest the people think that I'm just speaking off the top of my head or trying to simply philosophize the issue, if one of you want to go to Acts 17 and read for me 24 to 27, in fact, to 28, <clears throat> see how, if you can read for me Acts 17, 24 to 28, 
The Bible is quite clear. God has placed everyone, be, be he Muslim, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, Christian, exactly where they're at for a reason. What is the reason? So that they may seek after God, and seeking after God with all their heart, God will make himself known, because God is not far from any one of us. In Acts 17, 24 to 28, Paul clearly says, says that, specifically in 26 to 27. Someone read that for me. All right. Um, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he right. made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. Catch that, CL? Did you hear what he said? Yes. God appointed when they would be born and where, the times and the boundaries of their habitation. For what reason? Paul gives you the answer right after that. Why did he do that for everyone? Not that some, every single individual. Why? That they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Sir, hello, then read 28. Read 28 to finish it, and I'll make the comment. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of our own poets, your own poets have said. For we also are his children. What's Paul's point here? God has placed everyone exactly where they're at, whether in a Muslim home or a Hindu home or a Christian home, for the purpose of seeking after him. So to say that someone born in a Muslim home may have a disadvantage over someone who's born in a Christian home, not necessarily if we believe what the Bible says. Everyone is placed exactly where they're at for the purpose of seeking after God, which means that God in his goodness and faithfulness will make his existence known to them in some way with the hopes of drawing them to seek after him, to cry out to him, and then sending them the gospel witness. Again, I'm not just making this up. This comes from the explicit testimony of scripture the same paul says to a bunch of pagans the following in acts 14 verses 14 to 17 see how if you can go to acts 14 verses 14 to 17 see what paul says has god failed to give a witness of himself to all men paul says no god has given a witness of himself to everyone irrespective of their cultural and religious background or conditioning acts 14 verses 14 to 17 read that for me my brother but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed into the crowd crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? Why are you, why, we are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are in them. In the generation gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he Emphasize did. Emphasize that, CL. Emphasize that. And he, yet he did, did not, not leave himself without witness. Now, since we believe the authority of Scripture, this means everyone has received the witness of God. Now, some people say, well, how so? Not everyone's heard the gospel. This is, what we, this is where we distinguish general revelation from special revelation. The revelation that there is a God out there, and that, that is borne out, by creation itself. Creation itself testifies there's a creator. If a person looks at creation and cries out to the one who brought into being, in other words, if you look at the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the animals, etc., and you see complexity, you see design, you see beauty and wisdom, and you're moved to cry out, God, I know you're there. Who are you? Reveal yourself to me. God is faithful to respond and send you the witness of the gospel. Because Jeremiah 29, 13 says the following. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me, and you will find me, if, here's the condition, if you seek me with all your heart. That's the condition. It is not God's fault that individuals do not cry out to God from all their heart, asking him, make yourself known to me. Who are you? Are you the Allah of the Quran? Are you Krishna? Are you Vishnu? Brahma? Or are you Yahweh? Are you Jesus Christ? But God has given a witness to all men, and he's placed all men, so that they could seek after him and he's committed himself to making himself known to everyone who calls out to him from all their heart now as far as muslims are concerned they 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 don't only have general revelation they even have their the testimony of their own quran to turn to the scriptures of the jews and christians and follow their guidance is everyone with me and dave yeah, knows this yeah. pretty well 
CL knows this pretty well. I know it pretty well. We've actually used the Quran to prove to Muslims that you need to be reading our book. Case in point, chapter 10, verse 9 and 4, the Quran says, if you are in doubt about what Allah has revealed to you, what we have revealed to you, ask those who've been reading the book before you. Surely the truth has come to you from your Lord. Do not be of the doubters. Do not be of those who doubt. Now notice this, black and white, in the Quran. If anyone has any doubts concerning whether the Quran is of God or not, go to the Jews and Christians, because they're the people who've been reading the book. Consult their book. What is their book? The Holy Bible. So not only do Muslims have general revelation, creation testifying to the Creator, they have their own scripture pointing them to the truth of the Bible. Is it God's fault that they don't act upon the commands of their own book and turn to Christ and be saved? I don't think so. I said a mouthful. Maybe the philosopher wants to chime in and say something. Dave, well, this is your show. Maybe you want to say something. Uh, well, I, I, I could jump in with uh, responses that, you know, some that I don't necessarily agree with, but, um, you know, positions involving uh, free will and middle knowledge and and things like that that have been used to explain this issue. But I know Sam will flip out and call me a heretic. So uh, I'll just actually add one thought to what Sam has pointed out. Sam and CL, yeah. uh, all these years that, uh, well, you've been a Muslim and we've uh, we've been working with Muslims. How many stories have we heard about Muslims living in Muslim countries who did cry out to God and were given miraculous now not just what the Quran says and I mean think about that the Quran I mean the think about what kind of revelation they have they have all sorts of false teachings but they actually have a pointer in their Quran go read the book of the Jews and Christians lots of Muslims don't do it uh, but some do but even beyond this how many stories have we heard about Muslims being giving miraculous knowledge miraculous visions telling them you need to go believe what those Christians believe you need to believe this guy who's coming to your village to share a message with you. How many things like that have we heard? Amen. Dozens of stories, me personally. In fact, a recommendation for the people listening, I invite all the audience to go to the website www.morethandreams.org. Morethandreams.org. Testimony of five Muslims who saw Jesus in a dream or vision and were led to saving faith in Jesus Christ through such miraculous uh, you know, uh, stories, dreams and visions. So I heard, I've heard dozens of them. In fact, one of my best friends, who's now in California, his name is Jaffer. He actually had a vision of Jesus after studying the Bible and the Quran and being confused, which is true. Christ appeared to him, enabling him to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, Sam, we have, uh, we have roughly 10 minutes left. Do you want to sum up uh, the, your case on, on this particular issue? We know you can go into much more detail, um, but for, for people who maybe just tuned in or for people who kind of want the big picture, uh, yes. could you sum up for us? Yes. Uh, according to the inspired scriptures, not according to Sam Shamoon or David, David Wood or James White, the heretic par excellence. Just kidding, Dr. White. <laughs> we love you. Uh, according to the inspired scriptures, the one God is triune, consisting of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Those same scriptures testified that the Son not the Father or the Holy Spirit became flesh. By becoming flesh, entering in creation, taking on a created human nature, <clears throat> the Son starts relating to the Father as one who is not just the Son of God, but also a servant of God, thereby making the Father the God of Christ. In other words, from the moment that Jesus became flesh, and the very fact that Jesus continues to be flesh, flesh only from that moment onwards, the Father began relating to Jesus as his God. So when a Muslim asks me, or a Jehovah's Witness asks me, how can Jesus, who is God, have a God? The answer given by the Bible is very simple. Jesus is not simply God in essence. He's also human. He became flesh. From the point of the incarnation, from the point he became flesh, the Father, who did not become flesh, began relating to the Son as his God. Jesus, the God-man, has God as his Father and has the Father as his God. Because according to Jeremiah 32, 27, Yahweh is the God of all flesh. Now we know Jesus is Yahweh, so he too is the God of all flesh. But because God is triune, he alone became flesh. And from that moment on, the Father also began relating to him as his God by virtue of becoming man, by virtue of remaining man, by virtue of being flesh forever. I hope that summed it up. And I ask the Lord to forgive me for any mistakes I made. May protect the audience from any errors of exegesis. 
And if I said anything true, may he confirm it in their hearts and strengthen them to proclaim it for his glory. And may he bless my brother David Wood and CL, as well as Paul, and watch over you guys and use you mightily, especially for your upcoming debates. You should mention that because you need the prayer of the saints to go before you. Oh, actually, yeah, I, I forgot that. And this is very important. I should have uh, announced it on the, the previous show as well. For those in the Michigan area, for those of you in the Michigan area, uh, we have two debates coming up tomorrow and uh, Wednesday. Should have been saying this all along because we had a big marathon. Uh, we could have uh, uh, informed more people. Totally, totally slipped my mind up until Sam just brought it up, really. Uh, we have two debates this week, starting tomorrow and then Wednesday, right here in Michigan. Our uh, debate tomorrow is at a church in Westland, Harvest Bible Church. You can uh, look that up. If you go to my website, answeringmuslims.com, that's answeringmuslims.com. I have the, the ads for both debates uh, right there. You, so on uh, tomorrow, we have a debate, 7 o'clock p.m., 7 o'clock p.m. in Westland, you want to be there, I'll be debating Sami Zatari on the topic, what was the message of Jesus? Now, that's, that, is the, that is the crucial debate between Christians and Muslims, because I can, tell an, I can tell an atheist, this is the message of Jesus, and the atheist might say, I don't care, who's he? I don't even believe in God, so who, what do I care what this guy says? A Muslim isn't free to do that. A Muslim has to believe in the teachings of Jesus. So if we have a debate on the message of Jesus, and we find out that Jesus taught things contrary to Islam, Muslims have uh, a huge problem on their hands. And as if that weren't cool enough, that's in Westland. Uh, on Wednesday, this one's at noon, so it'll be easier for students and such to, to be there. Uh, Wednesday at noon, we have a debate at Henry Ford Community College in Dearborn, Michigan. I've never heard of a debate in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, let alone a debate on whether Muhammad is a good role model for society. So in both debates, I'll be debating Sami Zatari. I've debated Sami before. Um, I I've seen people complaining about Sami. I actually think Sami is one of the best Muslim debaters out there. Uh, so we're going to have these debates. We're going to have a debate on Jesus' message. We're going to have a debate on whether Muhammad is a good role model for society. Anyone in the Michigan area, make sure you visit my uh, blog, AnsweringMuslims.com, to get the details, and you'll want to be at those. CL, what are your predictions for the debates? I predict that you're going to make some excellent points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Muslim is going to ignore everything you say and make a bunch of accusations and try to bombard you with a bunch of questions that you've heard a thousand times. All right, that's CL's prediction. You've heard it already. It's recorded, so he can't come back and change it. And we'll find out whether CL is right here uh, tomorrow and the next day. Again, you'll want to be there if you can. CL, any final thoughts on this topic? Who, who, whose arguments do you like better? Your buddies? Your, your Muslim buddies? Who's giving you the arguments? Or you think Sam's got a stronger case here? I'm going to have to go with my man Sam tonight. <laughs> Sam wins the argument. Uh, Sorry, Shakur, if you're watching. Is that I Tupac? Hope you are watching. Is that Tupac? Uh, not, not that Shakur. <laughs> not that one. We found Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no holograms. Our Lord is risen for real. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Well, uh, we thank everyone for tuning in. Um, we, we hope that you'll continue watching these programs. And uh, really, to all of you who are dazzled by Sam Shamoon's knowledge, now, true, Sam does have one advantage that other people doesn't ha don't have, namely his brain. Um, but that doesn't mean that you leave apologetics to someone like Sam Shamoon. Uh, everyone, everyone, if you're a Christian, you've been called to be an apologist. You've been called to give a defense. And if you look at the Bible, you see the exact same scenario. You see people with different gifts and different abilities, yet everyone is called to defend the gospel. So you open up the Bible, you read about the Apostle Paul, who's a brilliant scholar who does, like Sam Shamoon, have a brain like a computer. And then we turn to the Apostle Peter. Who's Peter? He's a fisherman. He's not a brilliant scholar. He's not super educated. And yet, I guarantee you, if you walked up to Peter and said, hey, Peter, I think this Christianity stuff is stupid. I think you're dumb for believing in Jesus. You think you're going to get a good answer, a good reason to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ from this fisherman? 
I think you will. I think Amen. you would get some excellent responses, and those responses are available to us today. We can have the brilliant scholarly responses that Sam gives, but any one of us, any one of us is capable of giving intelligent answers to the questions of Muslims. That's why we have this program so that those of you out there who want to learn how to respond to the objections of your Muslim friends, who want to learn uh, how, to re how to respond to objections to the gospel so that you'll have the answers. We hope you'll keep tuning in. We hope you're taking notes. We hope you're uh, trying to, to, to get this into your minds, not just to hear it and, and it goes out the other ear, but to absorb this material because it is coming up and now just as much as ever uh, we need to be ready with answers. We're commanded to do so and look around you. The, the field is wide open uh, to share the gospel. We certainly want to do that. All right, we'll see you next time here on Jesus or Muhammad. Thanks, Yell. Thanks, Sam. God bless all of you. See you next time.